Welcome to Best Boys, a film podcast, an amateur film study podcast for the average Joe, the buffest buffs, and the cringiest bingers. I am your host, JP, and I am joined by my brother, Hollywood videographer. Corey with a story. Welcome back to another episode of Best Boys, where our only ambition is to become immortal and then die. Yeah, that uh, is the coolest line. Uh, I'm glad. I'm so glad that that stuck with you because it stuck with me as well. I'm like, man, what a badass! And the guy's kind of. He's kind yeah, he's of got the shades on and everything. Yeah, it's so many cool, <laughs> yeah. so many cool fucking people, and and uh, in this world, and he knows he's cool. That's yeah. the best part. Is he he's full aware of how cool he is, and is just hamming it up, fucking. <laughs> uh, yeah, very oh. cool. Very cool. So, yeah, that, uh, I mean, you know, I'm very excited. And honestly, I wanted to be truthful with our audience. I have not watched, um, I've watched French films, obviously. We've done uh, a few, at least um, one. Cl- climax. Yeah, at least uh, a couple for the podcast. Um, but I've never watched one this old. And I was, uh, and I've never watched any French New Wave films, uh, to be honest. Um, and, uh, so I was a little bit, uh, a little bit intimidated. I was a little bit scared or that I wasn't going to like it or was it going to be cool. I actually had seen a Karsten Runquist video who is a popular film, film buff YouTuber, um, that, uh, that watched, did a video on him after he died, I think. And which he, uh, if you don't know, Jean-Luc Godard is who we're doing today. And he recently passed away. On September thirteenth, and we are recording this today on October tenth of almost in, a month in the year of our Lord two thousand twenty two to the day. And uh, um, so yeah, I was all I already I was familiar with the name and knew that he was you know one of the people associated with the French New Wave, and that that was big and influential and and I don't know, but I didn't know anything about it. I knew that it was you know in the sixties ish. And I knew it was French, and that's about it. I knew a couple names. Um, and um, But yeah, I was intimidated. I was a little scared. Um, and especially after the, uh, to be honest, after the slog that was um, Tarkovsky. Um, <laughs> uh, I really liked, I really liked uh, The Zone, but, but uh, Stalker. But uh, man, Solaris was hard. It was a long slog, and I uh, feel like Solaris was an easier watch. <laughs> oh, see, I, I don't know. Maybe because I'm really into the post-apocalyptic, the st- supernatural shtick. Um, yeah. But uh, but yeah, I'm not to say not anything bad about those films, but they were harder. Uh, they were long, uh, especially Solaris for me. And so, but this was nothing like that. This was much smaller. But this is much. This is much more um, uh, breaking di- all the rules. Breaking rules is digestible, though. At the same time, it flows. There is a rhythm. There is a pace to these films. Um, and that pace sometimes will deliberately slow down and speed up and crawl. You know, to a, stop to a screeching halt. Um, but I think that is. Um, what makes these films really interesting, and I can see some of this style uh, influence some of my favorite um, filmmakers since this era. And I don't know if you picked up on any of that. Um, <clears throat> also, just the aesthetics of these two films, the time being the early 60s in France and Paris. Um, they are really cool. Uh, everybody's really hip and cool, but it's before the Beatles. It's before rock music, you know. So it's it's jazz and it's cla- you know classical and uh, you know it's that kind of stuff. I I don't know about about flappers. I think that's a little. <laughs> oh, I was just doing jazz hands. Oh, jazz hands. So yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I don't know why I associated that with with. <laughs> the, the flappers um but yeah uh it's very cool and it's very hip and i see that this era and aesthetically you know in a lot of wes anderson films you know the french dispatch uh for example uh i mean if it was black and white even the, the, the timothy chalamet black and white 
part of that. Mm. Um, you know, people are dressed very similarly in the, in the looks of the cafes and whatnot. Um, and just and everybody's super cool and talks super cool. Um, mm. But uh, there is aesthetically there is a lot, I and mean, I don't know how much is that is to the time and how much of that is to the specific filmmaker. I, we have to you know dive further into this movement, I think, to determine more. But uh, but it's there's a lot familiar uh, with the with this, and I was very surprised how easy of watch these were for being foreign language, for being so old. Um, it, very fun, very very interesting, um, very uh, honestly it felt kind of indie. They felt like indie films. Um, yeah, like I, I, like, I think they are. Well, the first one for sure, at least. Well, yeah, yeah, I guess they are. But, I mean, they feel like, you know, like mod more modern. The style of, like, mm. it, they kind of reminded me of just in the, and we'll, we're going to go into them individually, but just in a broad sense of the style. Um, uh, what's his, R Richard Linklater's film, Slacker? Uh, we watched that. There were some elements of that, the conversationality and the rhythm oh, between totally. the rhythm between scenes, how things just kind of flow into the next thing or or mm. it'll be something different or I don't know, like the, something like that. But also I, I see it on David Lynch's films um, with the uh, there's a sequence in particular in um, uh, uh, Vivre Sa Vie. Um, and when uh, there's the girls dancing, and there are these like men are playing pool, and um, the main character is like dancing to this like it's like kind of swingy music, and uh, uh, it just feels very much like I would see that in a Twin Peaks episode of just like a girl dancing, a pretty girl dancing to some hip music on a jukebox at a diner for like uncut an uncut uncut for an uncomfortable long amount of time um and uh like stuff like that i see fingerprints and i don't you know me i'm always trying to draw you know draw uh connections and sometimes it's just me uh making the connections in my own in my own small world with this the small universe with the things that i've seen um but yeah I, I, super cool and i'm very glad i've seen these um but i but yeah what do you what do you just got to say about all that so uh, for the the term French New Wave is something I've heard a ton of over the years, and I am ashamed to admit that I didn't really understand what it meant. I just knew that it was an era in film, like you know German Impressionism or whatever, and there's just different things that yeah, pioneered certain yeah. things. And uh, and so I did. Dug, this was me learning about what this is for the first time, and I dug a little bit in, into it more than I usually do. And uh, and it's wild to me that it all just comes as a uh, so like the Jean Luc Godard and three other like they were just film critics and they were just they were tired of uh, American cinema free flowing in France and felt that it was like a, they were losing the culture and, and they wanted to just break out because all the films were being just the same and boring and they want to do something new and it spawned like these films uh, which is uh, wild to me because they have the on on the Criterion Channel uh, which is what I watched Breathless on. Um, as a thing of just like there was film before Breathless and there was film after Breathless, and uh, and it's like a real bold statement or whatever. But not knowing that this era pioneered all these kind of film techniques, uh, makes it so much cooler because it was just like it, it's a bunch of like a bunch of just kind of like film nerdy dudes, like but they're uh, acting kind of like punk. In their uh, in their way of wanting to make yeah, films, yeah, trying like... to break the standards and yeah uh, <clears throat> norms uh, uh, and techniques. I, I think that that is also really fucking cool. So I do know that the one other name that the one other big name that I know from this era is Francois Truffaut, and he <clears throat> apparently he's I know that he was a critic, um, and I don't think he got along. I think that John Luke Godard and him they were colleagues at one point, and then they something happened that they like ended up not talking to each other for the rest of their lives. Um, and well, Francois Truffaut, I wanted to say has been on the show before. Um, cause didn't we do close encounters of the third yes. kind? Well, he plays one of the sci the French scientist guy. That's like going uh, around the world. He's like going around the world and like the, the he recorded the sound, like the tones and whatever in the beginning. And, um, Oh, wow. 
if you look at a picture, you might know he's got a very recognizable face. Uh, but apparently he, he passed away in his 50s in 1984. Um, but yeah, uh, I, that's super cool. Um, there's, we're going to, I'm sure we'll talk about some of these things individually. Um, some of these techniques, so I don't want to, uh, go too far down that hole yet, but, uh, but yeah, I, I'm kind of blown away, kind of blow, blown away. And a lot of my favorite techniques that seem unorthodox, um, not solely come from this era or anything, but, uh, many things that I like. I see in, you know, in moments in these two films. Um, so I guess we should start with the, uh, the first one. If, if you're ready, breathless. breathless and breathless is his first feature length film. Um, so what is wild? You... Yeah, go ahead. What uh, do you think about it? Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, Going into this, uh, I didn't really know what to expect, as I was saying earlier, and uh, and like now, and like knowing the background of of what it's like pioneering and everything going in makes it so kind of very much interesting that it almost makes it feel like they were just kind of like like Jean Luc Godard was just like had a loose plan, but it was we're just gonna like flow with it and whatever we think like whatever we feel like we want to do we want to do so like with the whole opening um with uh michelle and he's just breaking the fourth wall randomly like going on and on about paris and uh and how awesome it is and stuff and then you have this weird like uh i would say almost kind of like something lynch might do in which it, it's like how do you shoot a murder scene but without like conveying it but without showing anything and still having the, the impact and it's uh with all the extreme close-ups and stuff and then just hyper dramatic and then bam cuts right into being like a laid back like easy going noir that's kind of like more conversational and upbeat and light light for the whole rest of the movie and it's like it's just so interesting it's so uh it's such a cool way in the setup of doing all of this. it yeah. like yeah it just kind of like it, it sets it, you up it, for one way because it almost feels like because i don't know because like they give the speak speaking into the camera stuff in the beginning really throws you off, making it feel it's going to be like more documentary, uh, especially with how they do some of like the, uh, just like the walking handheld shots in the interiors and stuff. Um, but the, the whole thing ends up being just like very enjoyable and very interesting. And you're just kind of wondering where is this going to go? Where is this going to go? And for but me, then I'm you ultimately wondering, really know, like, cause he's got to either, he's going to either die or go to prison. You know, yeah, those are his two um, options. And so who's he gonna is he gonna take down this girl with him, or not? Yeah. And the uh, and I was gonna say for me it was when is when when is she gonna kick the guy to the curb? Because uh, he's clearly just using whatever opportunity to skirt by until he gets what he wants, and then he feels like it's just gonna leave town or whatever. I um, we thought that we thought he, he was gonna kill her or something if she tried to leave him or or something, and then just they kind of like. Like she did kick him to the curb in the end, I guess. But then mm -hmm. they had like this weird moment of like not caring anymore and just kind of letting it yeah. all go. Um, and then the police shoots him in the back. I will say a lot of stuff of the plot has got to be set up because, and I mean, obviously they could go back and shoot things, but um, there's a lot of dialogue that sets up things. Um, mm. well, there's a lot of like, uh, foreshadowing in the movie. Um, as far as like, there's a line in the middle where he's, he's laying in a bed with her and he's like, um, you know, I'm exhausted. I'm, uh, I'm dying. And it's just like, it's like, he's out of breath, you know, uh, like it's like a reference to, to dying breathless, which is the reason for the name of the title. Um, but there's stuff like that, like is the continuity is uh, really well put together for how like free flowing it kind of is, um, and then there's just like style things with like the uh, the jump cuts, um, yeah. where like if something's gonna take a long time, like uh, like to express, like some guy's gonna go on, he goes on and on and on about something. We're just gonna give you the that's like a montage of a conversation where it's just you get these long, these quick lines of what this guy says, and then you know it cuts back to the you know her response or whatever after all that yeah. talking. And there's like there's one in the car when they're driving and Michelle's like saying, oh he loves this about her, he loves that, he loves her 
her her legs. He loves her smile. He loves her whatever. Yeah. And it just does a cu- cut indicating that he just kept going on and on about it. Um, and uh, I thought it was kind of jarring uh, the first time, and then uh, but kind of also free it flowed kind of uh, well the uh, the other times. Um, there's just like things like that. Um, and you brought up the uh, um, the breaking the fourth wall in the beginning, which feels like kind of modern uh, in a way. Like, um, so you bet you're wondering how I got here. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of what it felt like. Well, here's my life in Paris, and I women are cowards, and everyone's cowards. <laughs> and this guy's just like it. Just the movie establishes that the guy's a piece of shit very quickly and we we find out how just it keeps getting worse and worse and worse and then until he murders a police officer and then like you said it kind of resets and we're just like oh he wakes up and he's going about his life and we're like oh yeah and like and then I, I kept thinking like oh did they you know did they catch him like he just, did he get away with this like this guy that big mm. of a piece of shit and then we find out that he didn't get away with it and he's just trying to you know, lay low for as long as possible until he can get out of town. Um, yeah. Which is also amazing just how long you can get away with um, something with murder in the sixties versus today. Um, like, I guess they did ID him pretty quickly within a, a day or so, but it took him, he was on the run for a while and he wasn't really ever running. He was just kind of, he's stealing cars and casually you know doing things as long as he had his sunglasses and hat on. Uh, yeah, he, stealing right. from every former lover he's had. Stealing from anyone. That, oh, that's the thing is he just he was door knocking into these different girls' houses, getting all the way into the bedroom, asking for money, saying, "Ah, oh, no, keep it," and then just stealing it anyway. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's very like, what the fuck. Very manipulative uh, guy, um, a womanizer, definitely. Yeah, he's the. Uh, and then he's just what he gets fixated on um Patricia and he becomes then uh then the, yeah the whole thing with her being uh uh pregnant that they like they bring up in the conversation like she has with her boss and he references like some book or something reference pregnancy I was like oh is she pregnant and I'm thinking it's with that guy and now she has to uh, Michelle's got to deal with um him being in love with her and her being you know having another man's baby but it ends up being his uh but i really like that the subtle foreshadowing of that where it's just like because it makes it seem like is she actually or is or they just is this just out there uh referencing something else um but then that whole dynamic gets weird because then it, it starts up her what uh um uh she needs to figure out who she actually wants and whether or not to keep the baby and everything uh, but it's done in such a quick way and everything doesn't like it feels heavy, but never that heavy the way that the the conversations roll um, and the music because it, it, it has this weird like vibrancy with all the jazz uh, as it uh, like flows through like the second and third act. Yeah. Um, but it's cool, though. I It's it's uh, it's very interesting just how the whole thing like how it all comes together i guess uh because it's just very uh, very unique like the the sections uh, where he's just chilling at her house hanging in bed all day in his underwear making phone calls uh some of that stuff just you know it's, it's holding on for like what feels like 10 15 minutes of just like them talking and it's real and the camera just kind of pans to when she moves around and he's just still laying in bed um making his calls and everything because there's a the whole subplot with antonio owes him money um which i guess like, like it is a, a kind of a big part of the film, but also I feel like that's just what ke- is keeping him there as an excuse to spend time. Yeah, with. that's what I realized. It, it's like, oh, he's gonna. This is what has to keep him here, and he's kind of just de- desperate, and he's fucked. He's kind of fucked. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah, I I liked it a lot. Um, the I think that there was some American dialogue. Or, I'm sorry, American English dialogue because the um, Patricia is a, an American who uh, is a student in France. Um, she works for the New York Daily Herald. Um, I noticed it immediately because her when she was she was saying New York Daily Herald, her accent would completely drop away. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe that may helps make this movie a little bit more accessible, as that there is English dialogue sections, um, but. But it, it sounds like that this is just his 
considered his, you know, most groundbreaking movie just anyways. Um, like one of his most lauded at least. Like yeah, this is what, the, what I googled like what's the what is your best introduction to Godard and then all everyone just said breathless. Um, and I can see why though it's his early, his first feature film and you can see it with like some of the like it feels like uh, the budget is low like once you compare it to um uh Viva Savi um you can tell it's a, the 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 Viva Savi is a lot more polished um and stuff like that yeah, definitely. Um, I was watching a video uh, about Breathless earlier in the week, and uh, it was talking about how, like, the and like a uh, the the relationship between Patricia being American and him being um, uh, Par- uh, Parisian and or French, and uh, and that's why he's in in the earlier when he's talking up about how much how great Paris and all that is. It's supposed to be like a reflection of. Uh, um, the dynamic of like American cinema and French cinema and like the fighting to like maintain the culture or whatever. But like within that, uh, the two still like need each other or like or work with together or whatever, but only for, um, to be betrayed by it, I guess. And it's supposed mm-hmm. to kind of be like a referential, uh, thing, uh, reflecting on just kind of like the state of French cinema at the time, uh, which I found was really cool and interesting. Cause like if, uh, even without that being like a layer of this film, it's still like what it, uh, what it's saying and what it is and everything. It's still like very groundbreaking for the time. Um, between all like how you know like how Citizen Kane was like groundbreaking and how doing story structure uh, and cutting around it and doing like creating what it essentially became like modern coverage of a scene. Uh, this did that for what ended up paving the way for what modern cinema that we have today is. And I feel like just as just as big of a way. Oh um, yeah, oh yeah, and, and just like yeah, editing and and unorthodox techniques, and I I definitely see a lot more experimental stuff in the second movie. Um, I actually think, mm-hmm. and I um, to be honest, I liked uh, Viva Savi better. Um, but oh, this, same. But this is um, you, you can just see it all here. It's already all that. Mm-hmm. It's already in this one. Like it's all mm-hmm. all um just saw how influential and how impactful this had to have been versus the other kinds of film. It feels much more modern, uh, compared to other kinds of, uh, films of that era, uh, or like pre, you know, pre that, uh, yeah. like the pre breathless and post breathless film era. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't really have a whole lot to say, um, outside of, uh, that it's a pretty like basic story. It's just the vibe is so it's just done so well. And, um, and then like, there is like, you're interested in knowing what you, you don't fully know what's going to happen. It's not completely predictable. Um, and, uh, it kind of like gets very open and free flowing. And at the end, uh, with like the, the, the running away, how he's run the like the weird scene with the police, and he's running away, and um, and he kind of collapses and smiles. Oh my god, all the stuff with rubbing the lips. Um, that, yeah, yeah. That he rubs his lips because of the Humphrey Bogart poster, and he wants, and then that was kind of supposed yeah. to to illustrate that he wants to live his life like a fictional character, but he's a real mm. person. Um, and he, you know, he wants to, you know, live adventure. There was like something, the line that was like, there was a sign that said like, live adventurous and t- until the end or something like that. Live dangerously till the end. That's what it was. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. Um, like uh, things like that, that kind of really uh, cemented the themes and established the themes in a more abstract sense, but also it, it it was effective in a literal sense with his goofiness and how he's just a complete jerk. He's a like, complete jerk in like every single way possible. I think it's but funny. He's the coolest there, motherfucker. In yeah, his he's cool. He's cool, but an asshole. Uh, yeah, especially to himself. There was a scene when he was walking and uh, smoking a cigarette that he, he probably bummed from somebody. And some guy bumps into him and asks him for a light. And he just, like, he tells him, like, fuck off, dude. <laughs> like, after he just steals and bums things for an hour, for 45 minutes and just 
tell some guy to fuck off when he asks for a light. Get your buy your own light, man. <laughs> that's um, funny. I don't remember that part, but that's funny. Um, the yeah, the, the his whole like facade uh, facade that he has uh, is it's all just like a front to uh, to play a character to get out of his like real shit in his real life. It feels like because you definitely feel like see the character drop once uh, uh, and get like the real him once uh, she tells him that she ratted him out. Yeah, um, yeah. Because it's just he's all it's just all business serious. It's like all right, well, you know, time to hang it up. This is you know time to be be an adult and then get shot in the back. Uh, both of these movies have uh, it, different endings than uh, in the way that they end. Not not so much of of the the story element that happens, but just like how they how they shoot and convey the ending. Uh, because this one you have like the extremely long. It feels like two minutes straight of just following him slowly running until he collapses, um, and then the other, V versus V just ends. It just like it's like all right, we're gonna tie this up in about thirty seconds. Bam, 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 done. Finn. Oh, I loved um, it. It reminded me of like a Tarantino ending. It reminded me of, like the ending of the fucking uh, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where it's just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's a really calm, slow. Uh, movie that kind of takes its time but is interesting and then all of a sudden there's a fuckload of action and then the movie ends. Yeah. Uh, it's not quite as abrupt as this, as this but I guess we're going to get to yeah. that. Um, so um, let, let's but, talk let, all right, let's wrap, wrap up on Breathless here. I was just going to say speaking of Tarantino apparently I, I watched an interview where apparently he is his uh, super duper inspiration comes from Jean-Luc Godard like uh, all of his um in all of his like writing and, and storytelling and everything, he's like a super um, big inspiration in his work, which I definitely can see after like watching these. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I can see it in so many of my favorite filmmakers. I saw, I can see it Wes Anderson. I can see it in uh, David Lynch. I can see it in uh, what do you say, Richard Linklater. I can see it in mm -hmm. uh, a lot of a lot of. Um, the people that we grew up with grow up in yeah. in terms of even the dialogue, the way the dialogue is written and, and yeah. Um, and what, so, and the, the shots. Yeah, so, so much of this movie it has, it feels like slacker to me. Uh, yeah, this movie, sits... yeah, this movie in particular, um, felt more like slacker to me for some reason. It was the way it was like the energy and how it just kept flowing to the next scene. Like it was like, there was like, it didn't feel like scenes. It just felt like it just kept going. And like, what's it called? Um, not uh, memento. How memento yeah. kind of like flows, um, around. Not in like the the rearranging of it, but uh, um, just like the story of this guy. Um, yeah. and like there's a little bit of a noir element to it. Um, both of these the films definitely have a, a noir feel. Um, mm. and and a lot of parts. Um, but all right. So I think I'm ready to score it. Are you ready to score it? I think so. I don't. I still am, and don't know what I what I what I want to give it. Uh, but I'm just gonna pick something that feels right. All right, I can go first uh, if it makes it easy. Yeah, I, maybe you go first because I don't. I I like the other one better, but I don't know where to put this one. I'm gonna give this one a four. Okay. All right, that's okay. where I'm sitting at too. Yeah, I think that that is uh. That is the fair, the fair point. And I understand like this. Um, I think I, it's considered one of the best movies of all time. Or I don't know which one I saw that if it was under this one or the other one, but it's like the Wikipedia. I think it's this one. The Wikipedia is like, yeah, this is one of the best films ever fucking made. You better believe it. Motherfucker. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's this one. Um, but yeah, but I, I don't know. I think, uh, I think it, it, I can see why, especially cause it's his first thing. Um, it's a little raw in some, uh, some respects, but I love the, the, the way the story is told in Vera Savi. Yeah. You know what I just reminded me too? Gummo, uh, parts of this feels like with the just super handheld, uh, just day in the life shit. Yeah, or it gets like quasi documentary, documentary, and that's how both of these movies are. Um, I, I do see Harmony Korine 
uh, in the list of of directors influenced by Godard on there's on Wikipedia. Um, so that would make sense as well. Um, but yeah, okay, all right. Well, for for it up. Well, we said we like the next one better. So let's talk about that. Uh, Viva right. Savi. Live her life. Live. Scenes. Live her life. My life to live is what. Uh, I was just reading what uh, on Wikipedia. It's uh, the French full titles: Vivre sa vie, film and douze uh, tableau. Because it's in twelve, a film in twelve scenes. Yeah. Um, so it's to live her life: colon. But yeah, I think it is my life to live for in like their English titling. Yes, yes. Um, so, this movie is short. For being 12 scenes, it is short. And it is uh, an hour and 25 minutes. For some reason, this movie actually felt longer to me than Breathless. Maybe because it was like, I don't know. The scenes broke it up in an interesting way. Um, but I fucking love this movie. So the movie is uh it stars uh Anna Karina who is an actress name that I've definitely heard before. Um and she is uh she's leaving her her husband, I believe. I don't know if it's her husband or partner um who she just recently had a baby with and uh, to be an actress. And she says you're not going to follow my dreams. I'm getting the fuck out of here. And she's trying to buy money off of everybody, 2,000 francs to start, get her started. Um, and uh, I think she, you know, she has co workers, everybody refuses. Um, and she, but she still goes anyways. Um, and she still tries to do it and whatever. And over the course of the film, she gets roped into prostitution. Uh, to make ends meet, and then it kind of just becomes her whole thing. Um, she gets deeper and deeper into it until uh, the end of the film. Um, which honestly, this is a plot that I feel like I've seen before many, many times. I've seen it in TVs and television shows and movies and and whatnot, but much more simpler and less artistic, uh, vibey terms. Um. I don't know. This movie looks really, really fucking good. Like the way it looks. Yeah. Like the shots, uh, uh, and like this, the framing and the, this, how, and I got a lot of that goes back to the aesthetics thing that I was talking about earlier, but just like the, and I mean, I don't know some of it's like the modern remaster and that looks good. Um, I watched it on HBO max. Uh, yeah. They both, they both I, I watched this. I watched this one on HBO Max as well, and the uh, I I'm just looking at the budget here. The budget is forty thousand dollars. That's not uh, yeah. even back then. That's nothing, and uh, that's uh, I was so shocked going between the films how much cleaner and more in like it looks like a '70s film in black and white. How much sharper it is, yeah, uh, and everything. And that was so cool. And then the the instead of you know relying so much on the handheld and stuff of the last film. Uh, this one has these like very much like choreographed camera movements to uh, during dialogue sequences that I find are very interesting. Um, just in kind of how it like forces your perspective. Like, yeah, none of this is meant to be. No, none of the conversations are meant to be seen; they're meant to be heard, and that's why like none of the, like no one's faces are really shown other than the main characters whenever they're talking, except uh, at the wild. end. Except in yeah. the end conversation, which uh is pretty interesting so um yeah there's interesting panning and and um and zooms and uh like it just feels much the mo modern camera techniques um like obviously applied to uh in to small a small dialogue based film but it makes it yeah. visually so much more interesting um like it doesn't really get stale at all um, mm -hmm. and then, but then there's moments where the camera is static and then like, those are the moments where it feels more like somehow it feels more intimate or feels, uh, it gives like, you know, it feels off or whatever. Um, like it, 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 using the camera in different ways kind of helps establish a mood or if it's, um, 
some of the conversations were be really, really zoomed in where like somebody's face is like cut off, like the top of their head and their chin is like a little bit cut off or, and you're like, they're like talking and it'll cut back. Um, but, uh, but then it'd be, uh, you know, more wide and, and, and just kind of seeing it like the whole room, like at the, at a cafe or a diner. Um, I don't know. Uh, there was something about the variance in the, like the way the different scenes were shot and this like, yeah, like the, like you're saying, like the choreographed camera techniques, um, camera movements. I mean, like they, the, it's kind of night and day. It feels so much more like a modern movie, um, than, than even breathless did for me, than me, for me. Yeah. And what's wild is apparently uh, this is one of the first movies to incorporate a montage sequence too. Uh, which I didn't realize that that montage had started happening that late in the game. Me either. Um, well, but, like the sixties is early though. Like even though films have been around since like the thirties, it's uh, they didn't really figure the, their shit out until like sixties. Uh, films been around since the today. late eighteen hundreds. I mean, like how movie making is uh, like now, like like uh, going to the theater and stuff like that. That's like twenties and thirties, I think. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I guess it was started. It started in the like early, like I, I don't know. I hate to say this movie, but Birth of a Nation, um, the the racist movie. Oh um, yeah, yeah, that yeah. was in the nineteen tens. Um. Oh wow, that's super early. Yeah. Um. But then you know there were silent silent films and stuff like that. There's so like the silent film era is long. Um. But uh, but anyways, anyways, you're right. I think this is like uh, the it feels like of the modern era, but it also is also so long ago. And like the fact that these are so, some of this stuff, it feels like it was done for the first time. Um, it's funny that you said that about the montages, because that is how I would describe how his jump cuts were in some of the the conversation scenes in Breathless. Like, mm-hmm. uh, where the guy was going on and on and he cut the, uh, just certain lines and it was like a kind of like a montage of a conversation. Um, yeah, yeah. so then he kind of just goes all in into it on this one. Um, mm-hmm. uh, the other thing, the one thing that stood out to me is just like the mixed presentation. Like, so when somebody's watching a m- both of these movies, somebody's watching a movie in the movie, but uh in this one especially it's they watch a movie called the passion of joan of arc and we don't see the screen at all we don't see the people it's just the movie becomes the movie that we're watching and it is like really fucking zoom like close up and it's a completely different vibe completely different look and vibe it's intimate it feels heavy and like artsy and um and, and but then it's it's all it's also helping establish themes and sta- and it's like um a kind of a, a metaphor for what this character is dealing with and or maybe how she seals sees herself or whatever um but uh but man i was blown away by the movie theater uh scene yeah that's uh that's interesting i i was just kind of like sucked into the whole thing i didn't realize that it was like it just became the uh uh the the movie screen just became our screen when it was a silent film like there's two different silent scenes in this there's a a period where they it's silent at the end and then this movie that they're seeing is a silent film um Mm -hmm. and uh so it's like a different yeah completely different style but yeah yeah i don't know i thought Mm -hmm. that was very very cool uh yeah it is and um I didn't really think well, you mentioned that, that uh about uh what is her name? Uh Nana. Nana or Nana? Is that Nana, name? yeah. That uh, not that uh that you were saying Nana is, like relates to uh what's happening on the screen with Joan of Arc. She um, cries. We see her yeah, crying. Yeah, because they cut back yeah, she cuts right back to her balling her eyes out and it's like, yeah, she's seeing herself as like the person who is trying to do like the right thing or whatever by being an actress and everyone else is just yeah not. she's very self-righteous in her dream which is it's very immature and the people are telling her that um uh yeah yeah uh, it's super interesting i i like very very modern very mm. very modern and i just seen like how many of these pe- filmmakers we've named do this kind of stuff and just knowing that this is the origin is 
or one of the origins uh blows my blows my dome mm-hmm. um so um just thinking about other things that blew me away um there's a scene where she uh it's the scene where there's a gun fight in the street she has like she's having a conversation with somebody and then oh, yeah. they walk away and she's writing in a bo- a notebook and there's a gun there's a machine gun you hear outside and it doesn't cut it just stays on the notebook and then there's like this pan and it, it, it's just like I I almost like thought that the machine gun was just inserted for no reason just to be abstract <laughs> um Oh, speaking of something abstract from the last movie, uh, uh, I, I gotta just say it or I'll forget. But um, when Michelle, his sunglasses for a brief thing, for a brief moment at the end of the movie, his one lens goes clear and his other lens is dark, and it's for like a just a shot um, for a few seconds, and then when you it cuts away and it cuts back to him and he has both sunglasses, both dark uh, lenses again. Oh, I didn't even notice that. Yes, this guy does want to. Ins- he does try to insert like very abstract things every now and then, but it's like packaged in such a digestible way that it doesn't like feel pretentious. It doesn't feel like it like takes away from the film, and that is like yeah. everything I love is like is that kind of stuff, you know? Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's the, the, the machine gun, the machine gun sound I didn't think was even real because of the way that it was inserted and like she was reacting and then people started reacting to it, uh, because they weren't even sure it was real. It was like the characters mm. were like, what the fuck is going on? Like, and then she gets up, she looks outside, she realizes like somebody is actually shooting guns and like runs out in the street for some reason. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But I thought that was weird. She's like, you know, what? I'm just going to leave calmly. <laughs> um, but I like I like that sequence too because whenever they pan from where she's sitting out at the table, they pan over to the the front of the store, and on the machine gun sound, they like judder cut it with it like that 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 while yes. it's like panning. Yeah, that's that's yeah uh, that, that, that yeah that was the other part of it. Um, uh, it was super cool. Uh, and just ve- it just feels like it was like it. it uh, it always feels some of these movies more the more the last one. This one it feels it's like a, all right. What's the proper way to convey something? And let's just try to not do that and to make it feel different. And it just uh, but it, it works and it, it gives it such a unique style. Um, uh, uh, with this, but it's uh, is this ha- is that part happens right before the end of the movie? Right? Doesn't she end up getting in Raul's car like right after that? No, no, it's about it's like halfway, I think, or it might be towards oh, okay. the back half, but it's not right before the end. Um, I think it was like foreshadowing for the gunplay in the in the end is what yeah, I think gotcha. it was. Um, but yeah, I, I already mentioned the scene where she dances for the guys playing pool, and she's like trying mm. to seduce them to want to like to pay her to pay her to uh you know whatever turn a trick whatever. Um, and, uh, yeah, straight up felt like out of a David Lynch movie, um, just the music and the, the way it was, uh, static and, Mm -hmm. uh, kind of creepy. It was like way long. It was way long to the point where like, well, this is starting to feel weird and uncomfortable. Yeah. (laughs) Um, but that was like the point. Uh, and I liked that a lot. Um, and then the conversation with the old man at the end. That is just like it turns into like mini my dinner with Andre and it's <laughs> it's like this long it's like a 10 15 minute conversation in this already is a large chunk of this short movie um if you think of like the percentage of the film yeah um and uh, and it's a really <clears throat> like interesting straight... really interesting conversation they're talking about philosophy and and whatnot yeah. and life and love and death um and uh the three musketeers the three musketeers. Uh... <laughs> but um, um yeah it, that whole i i like that whole segment because it kind of um it kind of got the uh the the main character into the same point that i was at uh, which was like well where is this gonna what is she gonna do like what is her like where is she going in life in this or whatever yeah and that's where, does like, this go? Where, where does this go where does this end 
And that's like, it's her. She just stops essentially. It's almost like her having a conversation with the audience of just like, I, I'm still figuring it out or whatever. And the uh, talking through it with the old guy is, was, it's just a nice break of everything. Like the movie, it's not like it moves faster. I think it has very slow moments and better pace moments. Um, but that section just kind of feels so like naturally conversational in the way that it is like even if the translation of the the captions i don't know if it matches the same as what they'd be saying um but it just flows so well and it's a nice break from just everything else that's going on and it's just a conversation about like it was something completely different but also very relevant like, relevant to the, to the conversation yeah movie. yeah yeah it, it kind of wraps up a lot of things um and she kind of has a moment where she you know, maybe has an epiphany on on how to go forward, and then it's already mm-hmm. too late because her pimp goes to sell her to another guy, and yeah, uh, and that's and that's that. The movie ends. <laughs> they have a gu- quick gunfight, and it's it's like a minute, and uh, not even, and she gets caught in the crossfire, and uh, she gets killed. And that it doesn't even look like it was caught the crossfire. It looked like they intentionally yeah. shot her, and then it looked like Raul got his gun and shot her as well. And then yeah, left. I wasn't sure if he's like she was just in the way of shooting the other guys, and he shot anyway, or I don't know. But yeah, she's dead. Um, and uh, you know that is that. Also, I forgot about she, the the scene where they read Ed, Edgar Allan Poe, which is around yeah. also right before the end, and it's kind of yeah. not long, but yeah, kind of a little bit uh, long. Also, um, it just gets very somber and and philosophical, and that honestly, that kind of reminds me of Gummo, of like you know voiceover kid reading this long monologue over some mm-hmm. footage of you know, somebody playing in a pool or something like that. Like, uh, um, yeah, I'm I'm putting these things together. Oh my God. I wanted to, I'm remembering something else from breathless. I wanted to talk about and those two cops, um, that they're like kind of bumbling, but the one, oh, was, yeah, yeah, the yeah. one was the super a, short tie. That's cut. It, at the... It's like crooked and short. And the other guy's got sunglasses and like his hair's up like a racer head. And, um, yeah. and he's smoking constantly. A, a lot of people are smoking constantly, Oh, but everyone is chain smoking in both of these movies. No one does not have a cigarette in their mouth. But man, I movies. thought that they look straight. also look straight out of a Lynch film. Um, that they look like yeah. two bumbling cops or, uh, in a Lynch movie or something like that. Um, they, because there was something beyond just they're dumb and goofy. They were like weird and cool also. Um, and it kind of had a, it's a vibe beyond just like bumbling cops. You know what I mean? Oh, for sure. For sure. The, uh, cause they weren't like that comedic. It's not like when they came in the room, it was like, there's a, something goofy. Like, yeah. Like something. Yeah. There's something like off and goofy about them though. And that's what I, I love that. Love that. Um, that just makes characters interesting. They're visually interesting. Um, but they're not like a trope. They're not like, you know, some slapstick goofball. Um, but yeah, mm. sorry. Sorry. Um, but yeah, the movie ends. It mo- It ends incredibly abruptly. Um, yeah, it's like twenty seconds, and then bam, like that whole Finn. She's dead, Finn. Yeah, I, it's like if it goes, I'm gonna tell Raul, and then she tells Raul. He forces her into her car. They show up. She gets shot. Raul shoots her. Drives away, and it's like t- maybe thirty seconds max, and it's bam, done. Movie's over. Cool. It was, that's so cool. like (laughs) like we're done with the story it's over (laughs) yeah no more story left to tell it just adds a a much more impact like it's like oh fuck wow that happened yeah yeah it's over oh it's just over (laughs) um you don't get to kind of dwell in it yeah yeah you're just kind of like oh i guess oh uh, that's it all right Uh, that's it all right i'm going home (laughs) Um, but yeah, I loved it. I loved it. This movie, this movie, the, I want to watch more of these kind of films for sure. Um, we don't have to do him again, uh, at least anytime soon, but, uh, I definitely want to see more French new wave because I get it. I see a, now I see this through line. 
this this timeline. Yeah, I'm curious what the like the slightly newer ones that are in color like because that this stuff would have been on the scene for a little bit by then. Yeah. Um, I'd be curious with like how do they try to push it even further? Yeah, and then you got other people getting getting in on it. Um. Well, like, don't forget, like, what's it, Kurosawa um, is before this, like, Seven Samurai. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he's probably got films all through this period. There's still other great filmmakers that are around before and uh, and after this around. Um, but it's very, very interesting to think, uh, to to think about it all. Maybe just I was. Uh... Good. I was just gonna say the difference between Seven Samurai and like Ran, the two movies we watched, were yeah. incredibly different. Like in turn, like one's much more modern. Um, mm -hmm. but uh, but yeah. I was gonna say I was reading uh into these movies after I watched them, and uh, it, it, it was read something that was like this was around these movies in this kind of period of time was when movies stopped becoming like. A studio made thing and started becoming like uh an individual's like artists thing where it's like the auteur. It, it, yeah like the like this 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 is like the dawn of the auteur uh we're having like the full complete like their style their vision is imprinted onto the film mm -hmm. it's like the what it was something saying like it was like the uh uh the equivalent of uh um a painter or, or a writer or something i think it was a painter um rather than it just being the studio calling all the shots and the director's just there to facilitate it. Um, which is very interesting because that's, uh, that's led to so much of how we are now where some, you know, some of the best movies that come out are just because of a single mind crafting it from the you know, head to toe to get a, get that vision studio interference can sometimes be good, but for the most part, it can be bad. Um, but it's cool. Just when the directors strike back. Yeah, they sh they did. They did indeed. Um until the point we have today. Well, they're still battling forever. Yep. The forever battle. Um do you have anything Disney else you, you want to add uh about my life is my life? Um I'm trying to think. I uh I enjoyed the sequences um that were like the one specifically, it was the conversation towards the, I think it was halfway ish, where Raul's talking to Nana, uh, but it's like you don't see her face because his head's covering her. You just see the back of his head. And the movie opens like that too, where it's just you're only seeing back of heads and then out of focus mirror of the person talking. But this is, uh, it's just that. And then only when it wants you to see like a facial expression of Nana are you allowed to. And it's just like, just slightly Dolly's left, goes back to center. Slightly Dolly's right. And uh, I just, I, I found that so cool. And I don't even know why, but it's just something about it. It was just so well done and just kind of forcing you to wonder why it's like this. You feel like it's like you're, you're aware of it being, uh, uh, not aware. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it, but it's just so cool. It's cool. Um, and the forced perspective, that's what I want to say. Forced perspective on things I find very interesting because it, it forces you to think about something different than the way that you normally would accept, like, the information. Yeah. But. Yeah. No, that, that I can agree with that. That is all super, super cool. Um, yeah, it feels uh, like hella, hella interesting, and it does not feel old that it holds up to this day. Holds up. Yeah. What uh all right, I'm ready to score this beast. What are you giving it? Um, I guess I'm gonna get be at like a four and a half. Uh, four and a half, five. I don't know. I can't tell because I I'm really like this movie. I'm giving it a four and a half. Uh but it, I mean I don't even know why I wouldn't give it a five. I, I guess I very well could. But I'm gonna stick it for stick to four and a half, um, because I, I really did I really did enjoy it and I feel like I could see that it it's laid the groundwork for a lot of uh, of my th of things that I like. Hundred percent. Yeah, I think four and a half. It's, it's it's it's. I feel like it's just missing one last little like something to make you like really ah. Um, but it's also this was probably ah for the time. 
Yeah, yeah, and that might be part of it, but I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I could be talk probably talked into it, but uh, but yeah, excellent film, excellent film. But uh, all right, all right. Well, that does it for this episode of Best Boys. Um, we will be back uh, when we are back. We're going to be doing. Uh, it is October. It's October tenth. We're recording this. Um, but we will be back next time with the Halloween episode. We're going to do some spooky stuff um, for spooky. you. And, uh, spooky season. Some horror things. So, uh, yeah, we might do one. We, won't, we might do two. We haven't decided yet uh, if we can squeeze it in before the end of the of the month. Um, and, but after that, who knows? Um, but we will see you soon. Corey, do you have anything you, you want to say? If you want us to watch the new Halloween ends, drop a comment. Because <laughs> evil dies tonight. No, we're not doing that. No matter how many people comment. <laughs> um, but all right, you can follow us at Best Boys Film Pod. You can follow me at Slob Thomas. And you can follow him at Corey with a story with a K. Uh, we will be back next time. Leave reviews and comments and all the things. And I love you. I promise. <laughs> Good night. Good night. <laughs>